Good morning, guys. It's Miss Hewitt, and today I'm going to read you Chapter 4 of Lunch Money by Andrew Clements. So Chapter 4 is titled Units. Standing in the cafeteria line, Greg opened his red plastic pencil case. He counted once, and then he counted again, just to be sure. Then he grinned. There were 13 left. Sweet! That means I sold 17 units. That's what Greg called the comic books he'd been started selling. Units. And selling 17 units before lunch was a new sales record. Greg's comic books weren't the kind for sale at stores. Regular comic books were short of tall, also a little floppy. Not Greg's. Greg's comic books were about the size of a credit card, and they could stand up on one end all by themselves. They were only 16 pages long, and he could fit about 50 of them into a pencil case. These comic books were short and sturdy, and that's why they were called Chunky Comics. Greg loved that name. He had chosen it himself. He got to pick the name because he was the author of all the Chunky Comic stories. He had drawn all the pictures, too. And he was also the designer, the printer, and the binder. Plus, he was the marketing manager, the advertising director, and the entire sales force. Chunky Comics was a one-kid operation, and that one kid was Greg Kenton. Greg snapped the pencil case shut and grabbed a tray. He took a grilled cheese sandwich, a cup of carrot sticks, and looked over the fruit cocktail bowls until he found one with three chunks of cherry. He got a chocolate milk from the cooler, and as he walked towards the seat, Greg did some mental math. Monday, the first day Chunky Comics had gone on sale, he had sold 12 units, Tuesday, 15 units, Wednesday, 18 units, and today, Thursday, he had already sold 17 units before lunch. So that was 62 units since Monday morning, and a little, and each little book sold for 25 cents. So the up-to-the-minute sales for September 12th was 1550. Greg knew why sales were increasing. A word of mouth. Kids had been telling other kids about his comic books. The cover illustration was powerful, the inside pictures were strong, and the story was loaded with action. The title was Creon, Return of the Hunter, and it was volume one, number one, the very first of the Chunky Comics. So that made it a collector's item. Greg sat down at his regular lunch table next to Ted Kendall. Ted nodded and said, hi, but Greg didn't hear him. Greg picked up his, his sandwich and took a big bite. He chewed the warm bread and the soft cheese, but he didn't taste a thing. Greg was still thinking about sales. 15, 1550 in three and a half days, not so hot. Greg had set a sales goal for the first week, $25, which meant that he had to sell 100 units. It looked like he was going to fall short. The idea of making and selling comic books had hit Greg like a crack over the head from Superman itself. It made perfect sense. So this is Greg's comic right here. I guess this is the front cover of Creon Return of the Hunter, volume one, number one. Candy and gum were against school rules, and tiny toys were boring, and also against the rules. But how could, it, how could he go wrong selling little books? School was all about books and reading. True, reading a comic book wasn't exactly the same as reading a regular book, but still. There was a rack of comic books right in the kids' section at the public library downtown, and some new graphic novels, too. Comic books had been part of Greg's life, forever, mostly because of his dad's collection. Batman, Superman, The Flash, Spider-Man, Marvel Classics, Uncle Scrooge, and all of the Disney comics. His dad's collection filled three shelves in the family room, and it was worth over $10,000. Once Greg had shown how he knew how to take care of the comic books, and he had been allowed to read and look at them all he wanted. Greg had even bought a few collectible comics of his own, mostly newer ones that weren't very expensive. It was his first love of comic books that had first gotten Greg interested in drawing. Comics had led Greg to the books like How to Draw Comic Book Villains, You Can Draw Superheroes, Make Your Own Comic Book Art, and Draw the Monsters We Love to Hate. Back in third grade, in third grade, Greg had used his own money to buy India Dip Ink, India Ink dip pens, brushes, and paper at the art supply store, and drawing new comic book characters was one of his favorite things to do when he wasn't earning money. That whole summer before fifth grade before sixth grade, Greg had worked toward the launch of Chunky Comics. From the start, he had felt pretty sure he could come up with the story idea, and he knew he'd be able to do the drawings. But first, he had to deal with a lot of the hows. How does a whole comic book get put together? How big should each be? How is he going to print them? How much money would it cost to make each one? And finally, how much money should he charge for his finished comic books, assuming he could actually make some? But one by one, Greg had found his answers. An encyclopedia article about printing books had helped a lot. It showed how pages of a book start as one large sheet of paper that gets folded in, in half several times. Each time the sheet is folded, the number of pages is doubled. So Greg took a piece of regular paper, letter-sized paper, and folded it in half three times, 
the way it showed in the encyclopedia. That one piece of paper turned into a chunky little 16-page book. Chunky comics. It was so simple. But not really. Greg figured out that making little comic books was a 10-step process. Number one, write a story that can be told on 12 to 14 mini comic book pages. Number two, draw ink and then include all, I'm sorry, sketch, draw, ink, and then letter all 16 mini pages, which include the front and back covers. Paste eight, number three. Paste eight of the mini page drawings into their correct positions on a piece of paper to make master copy one and a sheet that can be copied again and again. Number four, paste up the other eight mini pages to make master copy two. Number five, using a copier, print the images from master copy one onto one side of a, pro of a press sheet and a piece of regular letter paper. Number six, print master copy two onto the flip side of the press sheet, making eight page images on the front and eight on the back. So this is his process, one through six. This is where he writes all the numbers. This is how he puts them all together on the pages, press one and two, and then he copies them using a printer and a copier. A very smart kid. Number seven, carefully fold the press sheet with the 16 copied mini pages on it. Number eight, put in two staples along the crease at the very center of the little book between pages eight and nine. Number nine, trim the three unstapled edges and that makes one finished mini comic book. Number 10, repeat. And each of the 10 steps had to be done perfectly or no one would ever want to spend money on his little comics. After all the hows had been settled, then came the writing. But Greg hadn't written just one story. He had developed a master publishing plan. Volume one was going to be about Creon, an incredibly intelligent Stone Age hero who helped his tribe deal with ancient dangers like prehistoric beasts and Cro-Magnon martyrs. Greg figured there would be seven or eight issues about Creon. Chunky Comics Volume 2 would feature the future, where a superhero named Eon tried to protect a small colony of humans living in a world of melting ice caps and mutant life forms that were part human, part toxic sludge, and part recycled trucks and airplanes. Again, there'd be seven or eight issues featuring Eon. Then Chunky Comics 3, Chunky Comics Volume 3 would feature Leon, a fairly normal modern age tech techno dude who suddenly finds himself energized when his automat when his digital atomic watch overheats and burns its circuits into the nerves of his wrist. Leon learns that the watch can be set for future or the past. The six or seven time travel adventures of volume three would follow Leon to the past where he would team up with Creon and then to the future where he would offer his services to the amazing Eon. And eventually all three characters would have some final episodes together. Creon, Leon, and Eon. Past, present, and future. This was the pictures of the end of his copying to make this little um, chunky comic book volume one. And eventually all three characters would have some final episodes together. Creon, Leon, and Eon. Past, present, and future. Once the master plan was set, writing the first Creon story, Return of the Hunter, had been pretty easy for Greg, but the drawing was more difficult than he thought it would be. It had taken a long time to get each small page looking just the way he wanted. It wasn't like doodling or sketching. These pictures had to be good. Good enough to sell. When both covers and the 14 inside pages had been drawn and inked and pasted into place to make the two master copies, Greg tackled his first printing. The copier he used was his dad's, and it was actually part of the printer that was hooked up to the printer in the family room. It was an inkjet printer, plus a scanner, plus a copier, one of those all-in-one machines. It made copies in either black and white or color. Greg had stuffed about 40 ruined sheets of paper into the recycling bin before he had figured out how to sell, how to get all 16 pages, page images copied correctly onto the front and back of one sheet of paper. But finally, he had folded his first perfectly printed sheet, stapled it twice, and trimmed the top, front, and bottom edges. And then... One hot night in the middle of July, Greg stood there in his family room and thumbed through the very first copy of the very first issue of the very first volume of Chunky Comics. It had been a very proud moment. Greg had done some recording keeping along the way, had done some record keeping along the way. He added up all the time and learned some bad news. It had taken him more than 60 hours to make that very first comic book. But there was good news, too, because it only took him two more hours to print, fold, staple, and trim the next 100 copies of Volume 1, Number 1. As he worked on his drawing skills over the summer, Greg had gotten better, and faster, too. Plus, he'd had fun. He dug out all of his old drawing books, looking for shortcuts and new tips from the pros. Drawing was something he could do at night, so he still got to enjoy his days outdoors and also do the regular summertime jobs that kept money coming in. 
ink and I'm sorry, drawing and inking the pictures for the next two comic books had only taken him about 20 hours, 9 to 11 hours each day. And by the time school began in September, Greg had the master copy pages for the next two Creon issues all put together and ready to print. Plus, he had 300 copies of Return of the Hunter printed, folded, stapled, and trimmed, and ready to sell. Making the comics had been fun, but Greg felt that selling them was going to be even better. If he kept the price at just a quarter per issue, the profits were still going to be fantastic. He had figured it all out. Ink for the copier was pretty expensive, but Greg had a kit for refilling the cartridges. Altogether, ink for one comic, plus one piece of paper, plus two staples, cost him less than two cents. So not counting his own time, selling one chunky comic book was like turning two pennies into a quarter. The money was going to come rolling in. Digging around in the fruit cocktail on his lunch tray, Greg stabbed one of the cherry pieces with a fork. As he chewed the sweet fruit, Greg reviewed the sales, the sales figures again, and then shrugged. $15.50. That's not terrible. I mean, this is a brand new business. All things considered, Greg decided that Chunky Comics was off to a pretty good start. And before lunch was over, Greg had hired Ted to become the first sales agent of Chunky Comics, offering him a nickel for every two copies he sold. So Greg was still hoping to reach the goal of selling 100 units the first week. But business can be a lot like life, full of unexpected events. And 33 minutes later, standing in the hallway next to the music room, Greg and his new company got a shock. There were two minutes left before sixth grade chorus, and Greg was making the most of his time. He had just sold two copies of Return of the Hunter to Roy Jenkins when Ted came up and pressed something into his hand. Craig glanced down and saw a mini comic. Greg glanced down and saw a mini comic. Then he noticed the expression on Ted's face. What? He asked something wrong with this one? Ted nodded and said, Take a look. Greg turned the little book over. Ted was right. Something was very wrong with this one, because what Greg held in his hand was not one of his chunky comics. A tiny banner on the front cover. Oh, I gotta show you a picture. This is what was in his hand. Not one of his chunky comics, but The Lost Unicorn. Hmm. Uh-oh. The tiny banner on the front cover announced that this was an... This was an Intensi Bensi... Eensy Beensy book. The title was The Lost Unicorn and the cutest cover picture... And the cutesy cover picture had been brightened up with colored pencil. A deep scowl formed on Greg's face as he realized what he was holding. It was obvious. Some other kid was trying to cash in on his idea. And who was the person responsible for this? This sneak attack. This giant ripoff. Greg didn't even have to look. He knew. Only one person would have dared to copy his idea like this. But Greg, but Greg turned to the first page of the little book and looked anyways. There was the proof. In tiny, perfect cursive, just below the title, written and illustrated by Maura Shaw. And that was chapter nine of Lunch Money. I hope you guys, chapter nine, chapter four of Lunch Money. Have a great day, guys.